John's made it abundantly clear that to really know Jesus cannot be without effect concerning how someone actually lives their life. Now, that's not speaking against grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. It's saying that when you really come into that knowing relationship through faith, it cannot be without effect on your life. Knowing Jesus is a faithful recognition of who he actually is. And, as I said, a relational knowing, right? Chapter 1, verse 3, this koinonia, this relational fellowship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. And it transforms someone's life. It's a process, it's a journey, but it should be transforming. Knowing Jesus causes me, John has, has taught us, it causes me to acknowledge my sinfulness. It, it causes me to seek Jesus as the only rescue for forgiveness and reconciliation to God the Father. It also calls me to begin to take seriously that a life that now walks in God's light Right? John loves these big images, light, life, love. A life that walks in God's light is a life that, that rejects the deeds of my past darkness. As I obey Jesus' teaching and, and live a life of loving service toward others, as Jesus modeled it, as Jesus extended it to me, and this life of love, John has taught, leaves no room for hatred. No room to hate other people in the light of walking with Christ. So this morning, John's going to continue to emphasize this call to what we, we might call distinctiveness. The distinctiveness of a follower of Jesus. But sandwiched between last week's call to love others, right? That, that love is the opposite of hate. And, and this call this week to not love the world is a really interesting poetic interlude. So we're going to pick up here. In 1 John chapter 2, starting at verse 12, and we'll start by reading 12 through 14, and then in a couple of minutes, we'll look at 15 through 17. So starting at verse 12, I write you, dear children, because your sins had been, have been forgiven on account of his name, or Jesus' name. I write you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So most of us read a passage like this. We scratch our heads a little bit. So what in the world is that all about? And then we quickly move on to the next passage, <laughs> hoping that we can understand that, right? So what is that all about? Any thoughts? Yeah, so for one, we could say this is a, a reminder that it's important to understand that there are, are different types of writing styles in Scripture. Um, and so much of Scripture is not, again, it's just straightforward teaching. It's so here we have John teaching in, in this repeating poetic pattern. It's, it's, it's a very beautiful repetition and in this poetic pattern. And again, he's been writing about the distinctives that mark a genuine Jesus follower. And he's been doing this because there are some who were professing to know Jesus, but were denying those very distinctives. But it's almost like John kind of now graciously pauses 
to, as Roxanne, you said, kind of accentuate and encourage those who are genuinely in the faith. Like, let's get our feet back under us because I, I just want to encourage you about what it is to really be in Christ. Because as much as there are those who are professing light but actually walking in darkness and those who are professing knowledge of Jesus but not confessing their sin, not living in obedience, those who are professing faith but living in hate rather than love, John also knows that there are in fact many who are demonstrating true evidence of knowing Jesus within within the church. So John's warning those who are confident who shouldn't be But he's also, it seems like he's being sensitive to not sow doubt into those who actually are living a life of true faith. But in this life of true faith, and and Deb, you were were starting to get on this, that there's, there's still these stages of maturity, there's a few possibilities, a uh, few possible ways to take John's encouragement here to children. Is that a, is, is he again just going back to his, like the, the address that he loves so much, my dear children, my dear little children, is he talking to everybody? But then he, he mentions young men and fathers. It should be noted that John is doing what was very typical at the time and using all masculine terminology, but, but the whole church, male and female, should be understood as, as being included here. But more than likely, beyond just actual stages of physical life, John also has in mind stages of spiritual maturity, which may or may not sync up with with stages of your physical life. Um, That of spiritual childhood, of spiritual youth, of spiritual adulthood. So, there could be, there could be within any given congregation, a, 16, a 62-year-old grandfather that should be respected as a 62-year-old grandfather, right? For that, for his stage of life and experience. But it also could be that he just came to receive Christ. So in a very true sense, even though he's experienced a lot of life as a 62-year-old grandfather, has a lot to offer, he's also a child or an infant and that's not being derogatory or disrespectful. That's just saying the stage of life that he's at spiritually is he's a baby, right? And on the flip side, there might be a 28-year-old woman within the body that has walked with Jesus since she was this big and is, is taking her discipleship very seriously and is incredibly grounded and mature and an adult disciple. Does that make sense? So... It, it, there's this beautiful reminder, and you said this, Leah, there's this beautiful reminder in this passage here that, that to belong to God is to belong to God's people, and to belong to God's people is not to belong to an organization, but it's to belong to a family, right? To belong to a new spiritual family. So he addresses these different stages, it seems like, of of spiritual life and maturity. And to the spiritual children, John says, hey, your sins have been forgiven. Like, if if, if you just kind of go, yeah, you've probably heard it too many times and let it bounce off your head or your heart. Like, your sins have been forgiven, you, you are, you are, you're, you, you, they've been thrown as far as the east is from the west in an infinite line and dropped in the sea of forgetfulness because they've been paid for by the innocent one, right? Your sins have been forgiven. You can stand before God and say, I am in the righteousness of Christ because he has taken my sin upon himself. And, and what's cool is this, is, this is in the perfect tense, which means it's an ongoing reality. Your sins are forgiven. And because this happened on the account of his name, of Jesus' name, and we've talked about this before, when a name in the Bible represents all that a person is, and through this, they've, been, they've come to know the Father. They've been reconciled to God the Father. So this is where faith must begin. Coming to Jesus in repentance and faith, finding the forgiveness of sin, and being reconciled to God the Father. And this is what John emphasizes for the the children. 
whether that be all the children or if, if he's saying this is where your faith has started as babies in Christ. But with that said, a child still has a lot to learn. A child still has a lot to grow in. A child still has a lot to, to uh, mature in. I, I think my grandson is pretty smart, right? He just turned five. My grandson is pretty smart. But he's just now realizing that it's not appropriate to get so comfortable when he's over someone else's house that he can take his pants off <laughs> and walk around in his underwear. So this is a true story. So he, he just, he's like, That's, I'm just being comfortable, right? But he's learning now, like, okay, you can do that at home. But the tr- So we, Christmas time, he comes over my in-law's house. So his, he's, he calls him Oma and Opa. And he comes in and he kicks off his shoes and he pulls off his socks and then he pauses. And he goes over to his mom. I hear him go over to his mom. He says, Mom, I can take my shoes off. I can take my socks off, but not my pants. <laughs> like he need, And my daughter was like, right, not your pants. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a silly illustration, but in his mind, he's just learning. He's learning what's socially appropriate, right? Because he's a little kid. Does that mean he's not smart? He's not intelligent? No, he's growing. He's nurturing. He, he's, he's, he's growing up and maturing, but he also needs people that are older than him to say, hey, this is, this is good. This is appropriate. This isn't, right? So, likewise, spiritual children, they know the basics of the faith. Oh, praise God, I've been forgiven. Praise God, I've been reconciled to the Father. But I also need people who are older in the faith to nurture my growth so I can grow up and mature in Jesus, mature in my relationship with him, learn how this plays out in everyday life. And then he says, young men, right? To to those we can say who are in the adolescence of their Christian walk, I love this. John refers to them as overcomers. He's like, you're overcomers. He's like, you, they have overcome the evil one. They are strong, and the word of God lives in them. And, and you get this sense that he's like, as young men and young women of faith, you're now realizing my sins are forgiven. I've come into this beautiful new relationship with God the Father. But, but I've all, it's also plunged me into a spiritual battle. There's also, wow, this is, maybe this is even harder than I expected. John Stott says the forgiveness of past sins must be followed by deliverance from sin's present power. The forgiveness of past sins must be followed by deliverance from sin's present power. And, and, and John's like, let me encourage you young men and you, young women in the church, you're overcomers. You're not even just overcoming, you're overcomers. How do they overcome? Well, it's not just the strength of their youth, right? Even young, Isaiah 40, even young men grow tired and weary. But it's the strength of knowing they stand already in what Jesus has done and the victory that he has won for them. They stand in a koinonia fellowship with God the Father. They stand with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And what's so cool, what what John actually accentuates is that they stand in the strength and being grounded in God's word. Right? He says, the word of God lives in them. It's like they're taking seriously Psalm 119.9. How can a young man, or we could say a young person, or a young man or woman keep his way pure by living according to your word? Right, Verse 11 in that chapter, I've stored your, your word up in my heart that I would not sin against you. I just want to pause for one second. I say this to- with total sincerity that I am so encouraged that so many young men and young women in this church take seriously their authentic pursuit of Jesus Christ. I mean, these past few years and seeing that grow and experience, you guys have humbled me and encouraged me. I say that, I say that with, 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 it's been so profoundly good for my heart and my soul to see you guys pursuing the kingdom of God in you and through you. And, and if I could say this, I think, I think John would say this, that you guys are the new generation of overcomers, right? 
You're the new generation of overcomers. And the church needs that. Church needs that. It's a wonderful example to us all. And, and then he says fathers, or, or maybe we could say the, those who are just most, the most mature in Christ, who have been walking with him seriously for a long time. It's just so cool. John just gives this, this repeating, repeated encouragement. And he just says, yeah, you know the Father. It's like you've known the preexistent, and you've known the preexistent Christ. You've known him who is from the beginning. You just know him, and you know him, and you continue to know him. It's like, it's like this is where your faith journey began, and, this, and, and then you know you were reconciled to God through Christ. This is what has sustained you through spiritual battle after spiritual battle and discernment when there's been false teachers and false prophets, and this is what continues to propel you forward, knowing the lover of your souls deeper and deeper and deeper and longer and longer. In their years of pursuing and being pursued by Christ's love, they have, as C.S. Lewis writes, writes, come further up and further in. And we need this in the church too, right? We need the babies. We need, we need the energy of the youth, those youth that are overcomers, that are taken so seriously, having the kingdom of God work in them and through them. And we need these folks that have just walked with Jesus for so long and so seriously that, that it's like, wow, they know him at a new level, right? That like, I want to know him. And we need that wisdom and we need to be able to go to them and have the spiritual children and youth look to them for that spiritual wisdom. So anyhow, there's a lot going on there, I think. There's probably more, much more than I even just said. But let's move on, verses 15, 16, and 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world... The love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of the sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. So, John's just given these great affirmations to the Christian community in their various stages of maturity, forgiveness of sins, fellowship with God, overcoming the powers of evil. And then right on the heels of this, he, he like alternates this encouragement with caution. Because he's like, even such great realities d- does not exempt you from the temptations of the world. And, and we can say, like, he's like, children, young men, young women, fathers, mothers of the faith, do not love the world, right? None of us are exempt from the temptations of the world. And so John reminds us that, that just as love and hate toward our brother are incompatible as a Jesus follower, so is love for God and love for the world, And this actually echoes Jesus' teaching, right? Like in the Sermon on the Mount when he's teaching about greed, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. You you can't be divided like that. It just doesn't work. Either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Let me ask real quick before we move on. What does John mean when he says, do not love the world? Like, most famous scripture in in, in all the Bible, right? John 3, 16. Didn't God so love the world? So what's John getting at? What is the difference? How can the same author say in his gospel, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and here say, hey, don't love the world? What, what is, what's the distinction there? Yeah, so here we would say John is using this, world, this, this word world or cosmos in the Greek. He's using it um, in a different way, right? He's not talking about people. 
of the world, we're to love them. He's not even talking about really what we call the basic elements of God's creation because God calls that good over and over and over again, and it's still good, right? Um, so what we can say, what, what he's talking about is, is, is the morally corrupt values and systems of the world that are under Satan's control. Uh, that which stands opposed to the way of God, to the way of Christ. Um, as the old theologian C.H. Dodd puts it, the life of human society as organized under the power of evil. So why do you think he frames it, though, as dueling loves? Why does, why does he frame it as love? How do we love something in practice? Time, resources, energy, attention, affection, devotion, right? This is what we do to the things we love. So, so John's continuing to use these stark dualistic terms. We could even say maybe entering a little bit into hyperbole, but, but he's making his points with this dualism. There's a love for God. There's a love for neighbor um, that's outward and pure. And then there's a love for what my neighbor has that's not really mine that I want to selfishly take that's evil and impure. Right, so biblically speaking, love is not typically, typically spoken of as an uncontrollable feeling. Now, that doesn't mean, obviously, emotions can be attached to it, but it's not generally framed out as just this uncontrollable feeling, oh, I've fallen in love. In, in, instead, it's what we, within our own will, choose to set our affections on and then be faithfully devoted to. And these two forms of love, though they often seem to vie for our heart's attention simultaneously, are, what John would say, are in fact mutually exclusive. Love for God leaves no room for love of the evil in the world. And love for this world leaves no room for a robust and focused love and devotion to God. And I think if we're honest, like we know this in practice. Jesus is like, you can't be devoted that, like that in two directions. Now taken to the extreme, the call to do not love the world or anything in it has been interpreted by some as a call to complete separation and isolation kind of this isolationalism, like, I, okay, so that means I separate myself from everything. Um, but again, when I look at Jesus's life, I'm like, that's not the way Jesus lived. And, and then when I think about the gospel and the very mission that we're sent on, that seems to run completely contrary to the mission of the gospel, right? We're, we're told that we are sent into the world as Jesus's ambassadors with God's message of reconciliation, But yet there is something that even as we do that, we say, oh, I'm not to like completely separate myself and isolate myself. I'm to journey through this world with Christ. But yet I need to be asking myself on that, myself on that journey, what am I setting my affections on? What am I devoted to? And, and, and really in contrast to the extreme, it's interesting when you look at what John does here. Because he actually, when he speaks of the world, he turns his focus on the temptation toward corruption that lurks inside us. So, so this should caution us from kind of this separatist view or, or for us to imagine John shaking his, his finger at the wicked world, you know, that wicked world out there. Versus warning Christians that the world's values still can very much affect us in here, in our heart. Job describes what he's speaking of in reference to loving the world. Morgan, as you said, in three different ways. Again, C.H. Dodd calls this the essential marks of a pagan way of life. And the Bible Project just says that he particularly seems to be emphasizing pride and sexual corruption. 
The first description John gives is what we might call just an appetite for evil. And, and it's, it's interesting because it seems like what the sinful nature has done as we are separate from God is it's really distorted our natural appetites in such a way that it disproportionately consumes us with this never-ending, insatiable desire. So instead of having its rightful place and its, and its, and its within healthy boundaries, it's just this, this hyper-aggressive, all-consuming, insatiable desire, what he calls the cravings of the flesh or the cravings of sinful man. It's a heart that covets. It's a, it's a heart that envies and sets our hearts on what I don't have, or I, God says I shouldn't have. It's what our consumerism in our culture and our advertising thrives on. The cravings of sinful man. It's the lie of if only. If only I had that next thing. If only I had a bigger house. If only I had bigger wheels on my truck. No, no, no judgment there. Like, I don't know. Like, but it's just if only, right? If only, if only, if only. If only I could have one more drink. If only I could have one more hit. If only I could have one more look. If only, if only, if only. It's always that next thing. If only I can get that which I do not have, then I'll be satisfied. And then the second description John gives seems to dovetail with the first. And, and it's this appetite that's fed through our eyes, the lust of the eyes. And John is very likely has in mind sexual temptation here. And again, that's, it, you know, God calls sex good. He created it. But we are hypersexualized. We like, you know, we take it outside of God's healthy boundaries but we also have to realize that there's many other things that our eyes lust over as well. That which we see and say, I am going to take. I am going to consume. And even if I can't take it and consume it physically, I will do it through my eyes. I will do it with my mind. I will do it with my heart. Even though they're not mine for the taking. Right? This is what Eve did with a forbidden fruit. This is what Achan did with a forbidden plunder. This is what David did with someone else's wife. I see it. It's pleasurable to my eyes. One way or another, inwardly, outwardly, I'm going to take it, even though it's not mine for the taking. The old theologian Robert Law writes that such lust includes, and I thought this was very insightful, such lust includes the love of beauty divorced from the love of goodness. The love of beauty, which isn't a bad thing in and of itself, but the love of beauty divorced from the love of goodness. It's that which takes, uses, and exploits rather than that which gives and serves and selflessly loves. And then the third description John gives involves this verbal expression of inward pride or conceit or arrogance, the boasting of what he has and does. And this can involve all kinds of things. It can involve wealth, um, it, stuff. It can involve status. It can involve education. It can involve your accomplishments, your look. I mean, it, it can extend to all kinds of areas of life. And, and this is the tendency to have a, a pretentious and lofty view of yourself an overinflated sense of self-importance, and always look to, as one Bible scholar put it, always look to outshine others. And what's interesting, it's almost the flip side, as opposed to the cravings of the sinful man that longs for what is not rightfully mine, but I'm going to take it even if it's just with my eyes and my heart. This is an undue pride and overestimation of what you actually do have and a happy willingness to brag about it. Well, enough about you, let's talk about me, right? <laughs> enough about you, let's talk about me. 
oh, oh, you did that? Let me tell you what I did. And, and, and this, this is also something that also, even in the Christian community, can feign humility and find pride and, and have this, this need to always tell of all the good that we've done. The cravings of the sinful man, the lust of the eyes, the boasting of what he has and does. Let, let me just ask you, what is the actual temptation here? If you think about those things together, what, what would you say the actual temptation of the heart is? Yeah, I, I think, I think you, you guys are hitting it on the head. I, I think it's idolatry. And, and I, I think that the temptation is that we'll receive from the world that which could really only be received by God. And it's to set our heart and our worship on something other than God and then to expect goodness and peace and satisfaction and freedom and fulfillment and life to flow from those things of the world. If only I could have this, if only can I have this, I have it, I have it, I'm satisfied for a second, but and now I just, if only I could have it. And, and what we find is that instead of goodness and peace and satisfaction and freedom and fulfillment and life, we, we actually end up with the opposite. Tim Keller said that, that idolatry means turning a good thing into an ultimate thing. It's to exchange enjoying the goodness you have in gratitude and worship and thanksgiving to God by, re, by replacing God himself with, with overindulgence and greed and envy and lust and covetousness and arrogance and the like. Again, that doesn't mean that God would say you shouldn't enjoy your th things of life. You should. Within his healthy boundaries. But we so often confuse the gifts with the giver. And again, then we, we, we lose all sense of boundary. We lose all sense of, sense of, of, of healthy, healthy fences and what God calls good and healthy and just and fair and, and life-giving. We forget that it's the giver and not the gifts from which true life flows, fulfillment flows. And so John says, like, in the end, he says, like, keep your perspective. He gives these beautiful encouragements to the spiritual children, spiritual adolescents, spiritual fathers and mothers, and this is who you are in Christ, and, and I don't want to sow doubt, I want to sow encouragement and insurance, but keep your perspective. Remember what's temporary and what's eternal. As humans, we're, we're made for the eternal, but we have this disturbing tendency to value that which is transient and even destructive over that which is everlasting and life-giving, right? He said in chapter 2, verse 8, the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. The new eternal age is dawning upon us even now. And it's dispelling the darkness. It's dispelling the nothingness and the disorder and the emptiness of the darkness. And he's like, don't set your affections on the emptiness. Don't be devoted to the, to the nothingness. That's going to come. That's going to go. But to be devoted to the God of light and love and life, those things are forever. And in the end, there's a love that we're called to and there's a love that we're called away from. And I think, I think what John is, John's doing is, is he's pointing true Jesus followers to their, back to their true love. Remember who loved you. Remember that your response to God really is, is this response of loving him back. David Jackman writes, the world represents everything that prevents a person from loving his creator. We sing, and actually I asked for us to sing, and we're going to sing, right? He is jealous for me. He is jealous for me. And the idea there is that, that God is such a lover of your soul that, there, that he desires that there would be no rivals to his love. That there'd be no rivals to his love. So I say, what wells up in my heart that competes for God's affections? 
And then when I think of those, those lusts and those cravings and those things that I'm dabbling with and thinking I can love in both directions, it's almost like, am I willing to break off that unhealthy relationship and redirect my time and my resource and my energy and my attention to God who loves me with an everlasting love? Father God, we, we do seek your forgiveness. You know our hearts, and that is why you teach us. That is why you encourage us. That is why we need your word. Lord, you know how often our eyes and our affections wander to that which is temporary, that which is even destructive, outside of what you say is good and healthy. So forgive us, Lord God, for how often our eyes and our affections wander to those things that would even destroy us. Please, Spirit of the living God, set our hearts and our affections and our devotions and our, and our love fully on you, O lover of our souls that we would do that with intention, with our time and resource and energy and affection and devotion, that we would not be divided, but that our hearts would be singularly turned to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.